we got tired of waiting for the Tesla Semi to come about, so we said, screw it, we'll make our own truck, and I'll start my own electric truck company, and I'll call it Edison Motors, because I'm stealing Tesla's idea. This is the Topsy. She is an electric logging truck capable of carrying 65,000 kilos of logs, and she has a top speed of 130 kilometers an hour. But what's more is that she was born out of frustration. Frustration that the Tesla Semi was just taking too damn long to arrive. So Edison Motors founders Chase and Eric decided to build their own and this is what we've got. So we've come to Edison Motors HQ in Merritt, about 170 miles northeast of Vancouver to find out a little bit more. And this is the Fully Charged Show. Love the Fully Charged Show? Then join us live in Canada this September, the South in October, and Australia and London in 2025. Background, we're a bunch of loggers that have been in this area and truck drivers, and we really were passionate about electric, but nobody was making electric trucks for our industry, so we decided we'd make our own. British Columbia was known as one of the world leaders of toughest trucks. Uh, Kenworth was built just down in Burnaby. Western Star built down the road. Hayes, Pacific. You ask people what the toughest trucks to ever be built were, they were all built in this area. Because of the hills we deal with, the weights we pack, the off-road, we have built tough, tough trucks. But unfortunately, over the last 20, 30 years, American companies have kind of bought up the Canadian ones. They've shut the plants down and we We've lost our manufacturing, so we're trying to bring that back with that tough trucks built in this area for tough jobs, but just with the modern hybrid twinge. Before we continue, I do have to be honest with you. Whilst there are some fully electric options available with 600 kilowatt hours of batteries, many of them will be hybrids in which there's a fully electric drivetrain, but there is a generator, a diesel generator there to top up the batteries should these be operating in super remote locations where there is simply no charging infrastructure. And these are logging trucks. They are often in the middle of nowhere where there is no charging infrastructure. But fortunately, because there's some fabulous regen, not least when these are carrying thousands upon thousands of tons worth of logs, those diesel generators may only be running for 25 to 50% of the time. And there are many use cases where they won't even need that generator at all. So if we were in absolute middle of nowhere, when you switch on the generator, how quickly could it charge the batteries? Oh, it's, it's actually very quick, right? So this generator here has a 250 kilowatt generator on board. And because the batteries on this particular vehicle are 280 kilowatt hours, um, it'd only take an hour to charge if at a standstill. And, you know, we think it'll probably take about an hour to charge if you're driving down the road, um, you know, using pretty light applications, potentially like 20 minutes or so. But we think in this case, going up to 80% uh, percent, between 30 and 80% state of charge, um, you know, we're hoping to kind of see that, that range of two hours in full charge. And so you can do full electric ones and hybrid ones. What sort of scenarios do fully electric make sense and what sort of scenarios do the hybrid ones make sense? So fully electric makes sense if you're on an area with very short haul, say a log and haul, you're going up to the top of the mountain, you're coming down, you're emptying your load at the bottom and then you're going back up. Full electric can do that almost infinitely without ever having to even plug in on some hauls or they can get through to where they can plug in at the end of the day. Other trucks that have to do a little bit more range and a little bit more haul into the mill still need a generator. Like a logging truck does a 15 hour day in BC. That's what its legal maximum is. Um, when you looked at the power requirements, even with the region, it's still two and a half megawatts. So you need about a three megawatt hour battery. You'd be packing around 60,000 pounds of battery. So when we did the math and we were specking out how I, oh, this is, if I was doing an electric truck, I'd do it this way. We're like, well, I guess put a generator in there and. That's what we did, and now it can make it through a full day. Uh, so these batteries in particular are lithium iron phosphate. They're limited by a certain amount of capacitance. Um, so, you know, to be safe, we're only kind of doing 280 kilowatts of regen, which is still incredible, right? That's a lot of holdback power. But in future uh, trucks, we're going to be using a superior battery technology, which allows more uh, capacitance. Therefore, we're hoping to get 600 kilowatts with a peak of about 800 kilowatts. And that's still on the tandem. So pretty incredible. Obviously, that's not a very long time, but when you need to break, you kind of want it. So we wanted to make sure that we had that full range of regen.
The thing that really strikes me is that this has been built by people who really, really understand this industry. They have worked in this industry, they know what it needs. And as such, there are a number of very neat design features that I want to tell you about. First of all, the central cab position is great for visibility, but also because you've got these glass panels over the fenders, you've also got that visibility over the fenders. But that has the additional benefit of providing these platforms so that you can clean the windows really easily without having to get a ladder or anything like that. Again, making sure that it's really, really safe. We knew the trucks really well and we learnt the electric and we brought in experts on the electric. But we knew the trucks, so we learnt the electric. Most EV companies know the electric and then try and figure out the trucks. Everything has been designed for really, really easy serviceability. For example, there are no huck bolts, instead there are nuts, so you can use a wrench rather than a torch. All of the software has very easy, clear to understand fault codes or descriptions of the fault codes so that you don't have to go to some specialised service centre to understand what's going on. You should be able to understand it yourself. Every single component is an off-the-shelf component, meaning you could go to most truck stores to buy your replacement parts. And again, that actually just keeps costs down for people who ultimately own these vehicles. And that's the thing that I find really astonishing actually, is there's a huge amount of humility in this vehicle because they have taken things off the shelf, components that already exist, and cobbled them together to get a vehicle out that sort of does the job. And then they've been able to take that and say, well, okay, what could we make better? How could we continue to make this more efficient? How could we continue to make this lighter? For example, I have to tell you about this one. There are currently LFP batteries in this particular version. And because of the sheer amount of power that you get through regen, you need to have a DC inverter or a DC-DC inverter to ensure that you're not flooding the batteries with a huge amount of electrical current. But when they go to the LMO batteries, actually you can remove that need for the DC-DC inverter and again, experience another cost saving and weight saving. Uh, over the last year, we've learned the limitations of this truck behind us, right? I uh, loved how we can get quickly accessible lithium iron phosphate technology in this truck. It really only took us about two months to design, order and get the batteries last year. Um, but we've seen incredible technology advancements in Asia and we wanted to bring home the best. And lithium manganese oxide is the new winner in our, in our minds because it's a pouch cell, so less susceptible for thermal runaway and it's a very unique packaging where it still behaves like the ones behind us. So it's called a CPAC. And because of that, we can have a bit more capacitance in there. So instead of being limited to one C charging rates, we could do up to five. And on the flip side, we can do nine C discharging uh, on the batteries if we want to. Obviously, probably won't push it that hard, but the idea is this is a mature technology now. We saw them everywhere in China and we said it would be ridiculous not to bring this home and to test it out in the next trucks. Forests cover around half of British Columbia's landmass, making the milling and logging industry a major part of the province's economy, and especially here in Merritt. And Merritt was once a small ranching town, but industrial logging arrived in the early 1900s, coinciding with the construction of the railroad from the Nicola Valley, meaning that logs could be transported all across the country for processing. And today, it remains a centre of the forestry industry, but it does face a number of challenges, not least questions around sustainable forestry practices, permitting and protecting endangered species. But clean transportation is one way that it can start to reduce its impact. And Edison Motors, they're not just making brand new L750s and L500s, but also retrofitting existing logging trucks. And for Edison Motors, that means two things. On the one hand, rebuilding, like the vehicle behind me, which is actually from the 40s, in which they build on the existing frame rails and chassis cab and update the driveline to electric. And secondly, remanufacturing, like that one, which is actually from the 90s, in which essentially it's a brand new truck, but keeping the same cab. In both instances, you get a special dispensation to actually increase the payload by 1500 kilos and they stick with the same VIN number. Now, the other thing here is that as well as keeping these vehicles on the road for longer, maximizing the embedded carbon that exists within these vehicles, when it comes to vocational trucks, actually the expense is the bits and bobs that you add on top. For example, crane trucks, garbage trucks and wreckers. And in that instance, you get to keep all of that stuff the same and upgrade the driveline to electric. 
So what happens next? Have you had a load of orders? Are you doing different types of trucks? What are you doing? Yeah, so we, uh, we debuted it. We let some people try it out, take it for a drive, and we sold some. So we're building eight trucks next year. And it's, we've got a couple snow plows, some tractors, a few other ones that are secret projects I can't mention yet, but uh, I, I can't believe it. From what started as an idea, just to build a better electric truck for the vocational industry, has turned into actual orders, sales, a truck on the road. And we started with logging and then other people started coming out. Other companies are saying like, you, what you built, I want for my application. So companies just started reaching out to us and we kind of capped it at so many trucks. Like, hey, we're only gonna build eight. That's all we can actually build right now. We want to take the time, put it into the testing, but it's exciting. That's Carl. He's originally from 1962 and he was one of the first prototypes that Edison Motors converted to electric. But there you have it. Electric logging trucks built by, according to Chase, beers and mechanics and a good dose of why not kind of attitude. But don't be fooled by the humble origins of these mighty machines because they are continuing to operate as the team get better and better and better. And that is the fascinating thing about where we are in this transition. As electrification becomes more main mainstream, it can be applied to more and more specialised industries by the people that understand those industries best. And for me, I think that is tremendously exciting. Let us know what you think in the comments. Please do like and subscribe. And if you have been, thank you for watching.